As a Man Thinketh by James Allen As a lifetime gardener, I know that most plots of land will bring forth vegetation of some kind. If left unattended, I have little control over what is produced. If, however, I take an interest in the plot of land, planting, tilling, watering, I can reap a delightful harvest. James Allen, who wrote the book As a Man Thinketh at the beginning of the 20th century, likened the human mind to such a plot of land. Whether cultivated or neglected, it must and will bring forth. Some feel this idea, along with other groundbreaking concepts in As a Man Thinketh, are the foundations for most of our self-improvement books today. James Allen revealed the extensive power of the mind, premising that it has power over the body and forms your character. Its patterns become habits that can undermine or elevate your circumstance. Aimlessness, then, is the untilled garden, and humans are responsible for their own lack of happiness or accomplishment because they have not engaged the power of the mind. As you might expect, the power of thought must be rallied behind a purpose. Today you are often directed to focus on identifying who you really want to be, visualizing your purpose, and recording and reciting your specific goals. These techniques are rooted in the philosophy of James Allen. Thought allied fearlessly to purpose becomes creative force. He who knows this is ready to become something higher and stronger. He who does this has become the conscious and intelligent wielder of his mental powers. Extending these ideas, consider the young lady who, in her early 20s, suffered a terrible accident while away from home. A local priest visited her. He was there when they told her that not only would she never walk again, she would never be able to have children. The priest sought to help her accept her fate, but she insisted she would recover. In fact, she told him she had seen herself walking down the church aisle to receive communion at his hand. You have heard these kind of stories before. Years later, she brought the priest to tears as she walked, limping but with determination, down the aisle, three children in tow, to receive from his hand. According to Alan, though this is not his story, he who cherishes a beautiful vision, a lofty ideal in his heart, will one day realize it. Thoughts have power not only over your physical body, but your character as well. Alan rejects the idea that you live with what you were given at birth, poverty, ailments, ill fate, misfortune, and angry disposition. Neither would he accept that one is, by birth, a leader, a natural athlete, a picture of health, or someone with the soul of a saint. Rather, each of these is a product of habitual, directed, positive thoughts. We hear much about good habits and bad habits in self-improvement literature. The idea was developed by Allen. He connected thoughts to will and realized that habits were more than visible actions we repeat, like exercising or brushing our teeth, biting our nails, or smoking. Habits ultimately come from thoughts, and thought life itself can become habitual. Thinking positive thoughts, when repeatedly employed, can become a true habit. Thought habits, though not readily visible, have very tangible results, affecting everything from physical health to happiness. Using Allen's vocabulary, consider specific ways that thoughts can crystallize into habits and then solidify into positive circumstances. When someone willfully thinks beautiful thoughts, for example, they crystallize into habits of kindliness and grace and ultimately solidify into circumstances of beauty and warmth. Likewise, when someone who continually thinks courageous thoughts, they crystallize into habits of strength and fortitude and ultimately solidify into circumstances of leadership and freedom. Unfortunately, thoughts can be turned off, ignored, or allowed to run wild. Uncontrolled thoughts lead to aimlessness and vice. Thoughts that are not tethered and put to good use can even lead to ultimate destruction. When a person looks around at his life and sees failure after failure, in skills, in business endeavors, and in relationships, fate is often blamed. But according to Allen, the person is responsible, not the externals. Humans tend to blame other people, bad circumstances, or luck. While we cannot fully control circumstances or other people, we can adapt and turn bad circumstances to some advantage if we approach them with the power wielded by positive thinking. Perhaps you have seen someone struggle against failure after failure, and you know you have some advice that would change things for them. Perhaps you have tried to influence them, turn them in a different direction, or give them the boost they need to turn the tides. These are noble efforts, and Alan would not discourage you from them. However, you must realize that ultimately, each person is responsible for making the change themselves. You cannot force someone to change. 
If you are trying to make a difference in someone's life, go for it. But realize that the old adage, you can lead a horse to water but you cannot make him drink, is very true. Allen puts it this way, A strong man cannot help a weaker unless the weaker is willing to be helped. None but himself can alter his condition. And if you are the one thinking things should be better in your life, it is essential that you quit blaming failures and lack of resources on the externals and look inward. Ultimately, you are responsible. Alan insists that you have the power to overcome negative circumstances. The power is your mind. When you see someone who is successful, happy, and calm, study them. It is not luck that put them where they are, nor a pleasant disposition from birth. Analyze what makes them tick. You will probably find that things have not always been easy for them and that they have overcome some considerable hurdles. They have overcome by controlling their thoughts so that they could willfully overcome the odds. They have expended incredible effort and self-control to wear the face of contentment and serenity. And in this serenity, they succeed. For the more tranquil a man becomes, the greater is his success, his influence, his power for good. So it is well worth your efforts to till the garden of your mind. As Alan encourages, by pursuing this process, a man sooner or later discovers that he is the master gardener of his soul, the director of his life.